bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Let me begin by thanking all of our volunteers who participated in our Hallelujah Night activities last night. Preliminary numbers indicate that over 300 children were in our sanctuary last night, and there were over 20 commitments made. If you were a volunteer last night during our Hallelujah Night, could you please stand? Amen. Thank you for allowing God to use you in that capacity, and, and a special thank goes out to is, is Meredith here this morning. Amen. Hey, Meredith. <laughs> An event like Hallelujah Night doesn't just happen. Uh, it takes people working together, a coordinated effort. And the person who led us in this effort was Meredith, so we thank you so much for everything that you did and dedication for Hallelujah Night. Let's do it all over again next year. <laughs> Amen. For all of you who believe in prayer, for all of you who believe in miracles, I, I, I need you to get on your knees tonight and begin praying for our New York Mets. They are on life support, but I believe God can still raise the dead. <laughs> I'm, I'm hoping for a miracle. I'm praying with you and for you, for the Mets. <laughs> if you have your copy of God's Word with you this morning, I invite you to turn in there with me to, to the book of 1 Peter, to 1 Peter chapter 3. First Peter chapter 3, you've arrived at that location in your Bible, announce that you've arrived by saying amen. If you need another minute, say I need another minute. First Peter chapter 3, central, even in the midst of your suffering, you should still be about doing God's work. Even in the midst of your suffering, you should still be about doing God's work. First Peter chapter 3, we'll be reading together verses 13 through verse 16. My Bible reads this way. Who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. Will you pray with me? Father God, teach us great truths contained in your word. Truths that will leave us changed, Lord God. Truths that will leave us inspired and motivated to do your work. And our prayer as always is this that as your word is explained, you would be exalted and glorified and lifted up. And we pray this in Jesus' name. And all who are God's people said. Acts chapter 16 records one of the most popular and one of the most familiar stories of the New Testament. Paul and Silas are continuing their missionary work in Philippi. Up to that point, their missionary work had not been entirely successful. They, they were only able to, 
to convert one family to their gospel message. During their time in, in Philippi, they encounter a woman who was demon-possessed. And because their mission in that city was not just to preach the message of the gospel, but also to do good work, they perform an exorcist. This woman, her demon possession, had made her masters a considerable amount of money. And they became enraged at Paul and Silas because of their good work. They, a riot ensues in the city against Paul and Silas. They are badly beaten and thrown in jail. The drama happens for Paul and Silas while they are in jail. Remember, they had just been badly beaten. They had just been persecuted and abused by almost an entire city. But even in the midst of, of their suffering, they are in jail singing and praising God at, at that point. Maybe in response to their praise, an earthquake occurs in the city and the, the doors of the prison are miraculously opened. And Paul and Silas have an opportunity to, to escape. The Philippian jailer notices what has happened and, and he instantly realizes that, that if the people in prison escape, his life will be taken from him. So he attempts suicide. It's at that point, Paul and Silas intervene and announced to the jailer that they are not planning on going anywhere. And similarly, all the prisoners announced the same thing. Astonished, the Philippian jailer exclaims to Paul and Silas, what must I do to be saved? Paul and Silas share the message of the gospel and the Bible says the Philippian jailer and his entire family are saved. My mission this morning is simple central. I want to encourage you to adopt the attitude that Paul and Silas had in their suffering, that you will continue to praise God. And even in your suffering, you will be prepared at any moment to take advantage of an opportunity to share your faith. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 13 is the beginning of a lengthy section of the book of 1 Peter that deals with believers' response and attitude towards suffering. At the end of the previous section of the book of 1 Peter, the apostle Peter stressed the importance of always doing the right thing. As Christians, we are called in a wicked society to be lights that shine brightly. We are called to do good works. The exhortation that Peter gives in the previous section to do good works brings up another important issue in the book of First Peter. You do know that just because you, you do good works, just because you, you try to live a righteous life, just because you try to treat people fairly, doesn't mean that you will be immune from suffering. Just because you try to treat people justly does not mean that they will reciprocate in kind. The, the, the idea of do unto others as you would have them do unto you is a Christian principle that the world does not follow. And like a good coach preparing his team for the drama that they will face in the game, Peter is preparing Christians for the drama that they will face in the world. Our righteous deeds, our good acts, our willingness to share, our willingness to, to do unto others as, they would, as we would like them to do unto us does not prevent us from suffering. Oftentimes, we will suffer as a result. It is a reality that Peter himself experienced. In, in Acts chapter 3, Peter and John are, 
are on their way to the temple to worship God, when, when they encounter a man who was born without the ability to, to use his legs, the man is, is at the temple gates begging for alms. And then he asks Peter and John for, for money. And like most Christians, Peter and John respond, I'm broke. <laughs> but Peter and John do have something else to offer this man born lame. In the name of Jesus, Peter heals the lame man. The healing of the lame man provides Peter and John the platform and, and the opportunity to begin to share their faith. And when the Jewish authorities learn of what has happened, they beat Peter and John and throw them in jail. Peter himself experienced pain, persecution, and suffering for doing good works. And because Peter experienced it, he knew and understand that we will all experience it. And in the event you do experience suffering, you are persecuted, you are abused for trying to live right and treat others fairly, what should be your response? In the span of these four verses, Peter tells us how we should respond inwardly, how we should respond upwardly, and how we should respond outwardly. Verse 13 begins with a rhetorical question that is designed to serve as encouragement to a group of already persecuted Christians. The implied answer of the rhetorical question of verse 13, who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good, is no one because no one can harm you, the, the harm that Peter has in mind. It's not the harm that we experience in the present, but the harm that comes from our eternal judgment. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 17, Peter has already identified God as the one who judges impartially. And in chapter 3, verse 12, Peter says that God's face is against those who do evil. Now he reminds us as believers, if we commit to doing good works. No one will be able to harm us in the future because God has guaranteed our eternity. We are eternally secured in God. So regardless of what happens in the here and now, our future is always safe. Paul asks the same question and says the same thing in Romans 8.31. He asks, if God is for us, who can be against us? The, the point of Paul's question in Romans 8 and the point of Peter's question in 1 Peter 3 is to encourage us to continue to do the work of Christ knowing that nothing can jeopardize our inheritance and nothing can impact our future. The good news of verse 13 is followed with bad news and, and good news in verse 14. Let me give you the, the bad news first. Yes, your eternity is secure. Yes, you are protected for the future but not so much for the here and now. Peter predicts in verse 14, the possibility that we may suffer for doing good in the here and now. What is a prediction for Peter is, is a certainty for Jesus. And Jesus in the Gospel of John reminds us that in this world, you will have trouble. Being a Christian does not prevent you from suffering. Oftentimes, being a Christian is the cause of your suffering. Vaccines are, are substances administered into the body to help the body develop immunity against certain diseases. You, you'll hear a lot about vaccinations this time of year because people expect you to get the, the flu vaccine. And when you were younger, before you went to school, you, you had to get uh, vaccinations for polio, for measles, 
for, for smallpox, for all types of things, because vaccines prevent you from getting a certain type of disease. There are Christian preachers out there who will tell you that your faith is a vaccination against suffering, and that is not the case. Just because you are a believer does not mean that you are permanently vaccinated against suffering. You will experience trials. You will experience abuse. You will experience persecution. That's the bad news. But the good news is the same God who is working to protect you in the future is the same God who is with you in your trials today. Peter says that just because you are suffering doesn't mean that you're not also blessed. Just because you are suffering doesn't mean that you are not also blessed. Peter seemingly juxtaposes two ideas that don't fit. Suffering and being blessed. <laughs> I never equate my suffering with being blessed. When, when we think of blessing, we think of unexpected financial reward. When, when we think of blessing, we think of getting something that we don't deserve. When, when we think of blessing, we think of being kept from abuse, kept from persecution, kept from suffering. Why in the world does Peter inform us that in our suffering we are still blessed? Apparently, Peter does not understand the meaning <laughs> of blessed. The term blessed, though we often associate it with tangible things, is not related to tangible things. The term blessed actually refers to a status. The word literally means to be honored or to be esteemed by someone. To be blessed is a standing at and a status. Evidence of our standing and our status can sometimes be the tangible and material things that, that God gives us. But to be blessed doesn't mean that you are in possession of these material things. To be blessed means that you are in right relationship with God. We are blessed when God looks at us through the lens of Jesus Christ and our position in Christ is changed. We are blessed when because of our status, God involves us in his work. We are blessed when God chooses us to use us for our glory. The things that we consider as being evidenced of our blessed status is not always the case. Being blessed simply means that I am rightly related to God. Jesus understood this because in Matthew chapter 5, he said blessed about people who you wouldn't consider are blessed. In Matthew chapter 5, Jesus says, blessed are the poor. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who mourn and blessed are the persecuted because they are in right standing to God. And if this is the case, and Peter understands this, then it is possible for you to be blessed and broke at the same time. It, it is possible for you to be blessed and struggling at the same time. And yes, it is possible for you to be blessed and suffering. Your situation is not always an indication of your standing and your status before God. You can be blessed 
and highly favored and have no money in your pocket. Karen Jobes writes that it is the privilege of living rightly because of Christ and suffering for it that is nothing less than a blessing and a sign of God's favor and evidence of one's salvation. When God uses you and empowers you to do his will, regardless of his, your outside circumstances, you are blessed. In Job chapter 1, we are introduced to a man named Job. Introduction. He has all the trappings of someone who is blessed. He is wealthy, one of the wealthiest men of his region. And in that day and age, because children were evidence of a blessed status, we are told that, that Job had more than a quiver full. He had 10 children. And then the, the curtains of heaven are pulled back. And we are allowed to eavesdrop in heaven's throne room. And, and there we hear a conversation between God and Satan. We, we know that Satan is on the prowl, looking to destroy and ruin the life of someone. And God knows this too. And knowing Satan's intention, God says to Satan about Job, have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. This is evidence of his blessed status. And because Job is blessed, we are given further evidence of his status, of his standing before God, because God allows him to suffer as a blessed man. You missed it, Central. Job did not suffer because he wasn't blessed. God's statement about Job indicates that he's blessed. Job suffered because he was blessed. Because if Job wasn't blessed, God would have never pointed him out. If God, Job wasn't upright, if Job wasn't rightly related to God, God would have never mentioned his name central. You may be suffering right now. You may be going through severe trials and persecution. You may be enduring abuse because you're so blessed in heaven, God mentioned your name. Peter says that it's possible for us to be both suffering and blessed. And, this, and if this is the case, inwardly, we need to recognize that our circumstances, our situations, do not determine our status and our standing before God. In response to our suffering, inwardly, we should rejoice because if we are doing the right thing, despite our circumstances, we are still blessed. How do Christians respond to suffering? Inwardly, we recognize that we are blessed. But what about upwardly? Verse 14 closes with a quote from the Old Testament book of Isaiah. In Isaiah chapter 8, Judah is being threatened by two nations, Israel and Aram. Israel and Aram want to force Judah to be part of this coalition, this, this military unit aimed at defeating the superpower of the day, Assyria. And because of the threats of Israel and, and Aram, Judah, its inhabitants, and its king are frightened. The word of the Lord comes to Isaiah and says to Isaiah, repeat this to the people and to the king. Do not be afraid of what others can do for, to you. 
Peter borrows from the context of this passage in Isaiah and encourages his readers who are also threatened and afraid of what others can do to them to not be frightened and to not be afraid. Because when it comes to, to people, when it comes to their threats, when it comes to what they can do to you, their bark is always louder than their bite. Psalm 118 verse 6 says, the Lord is with me. I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? And, and Jesus in Matthew 10, 28 says, do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both the soul and the body in hell. You and I, as believers in Christ, should never be afraid or threatened because of what people can do to us. In verse 15, Peter proposes an alternative way of living. Rather than living in constant fear of what people can do to you, Peter proposes that we should live in reverence to God. The, that word reverence translates a Greek verb that means to, to set apart. When applied to things, it means to dedicate. When applied to people, it means to sanctify. But when applied to God, it means to venerate and to treat as holy. To revere God is an internal disposition of the heart expressed outwardly. It is a private matter with public demonstration. Those who revere God express their reverence for God through their actions, most notably through the activity of worship. When we revere God, it means that we esteem God and worship God. He, here's what Peter is saying. That when you go through your experience of persecution, when you go through your experience of abuse, that when you suffer, don't be afraid of people. Rather, continue to worship God. What Peter is saying to us is that regardless of what you are going through, regardless of what you are experiencing, there is never a reason in the Christian life for the Christian to stop the worship of God. And remember the audience that Peter is writing to Peter may have been writing during the time of Nero. You, you do know who Nero was. Nero was the emperor of Rome who had the city of Rome burned down and then blamed it on the Christians. And that act initiated a series of persecutions aimed at Christians where Christians would sometimes be placed and hung on poles and lit up on fire to act as street lights through Rome. This describes the intensity of their persecution. And Peter is saying to that same group, I know you're hurting. I know you're suffering. I know you're persecuted. I know you're being abused. But that still should not impact your worship. Our worship should not be impacted by our circumstances or our situation because we don't worship a God because he blesses us with material things. We, we worship a God because he is worthy. Peter is rolling over in his grave thinking about how some of y'all <laughs> When you lose your job, you quit coming to church because your worship is impacted by your situation. How, how some of you, when, when you break up with your boyfriend or girlfriend, you, you stop worshiping because your, your relationship determines your level of commitment to God, that your reverence to God can be impacted by your situation. 
as if God is not worthy of your worship regardless of what you're going through. When the last year I, I, I had the privilege of, of ministering to two in, in, incredible, incredible women as, as they were dealing uh, with various ailments that would eventually claim their lives. Uh, I would visit them in, in the hospital, would visit them in their home, and, and upon every successive visit, their condition deteriorated. They were obviously suffering, they were obviously going through trials, and, and they were obviously just, just in constant pain. But every visit, their conversation always went the same. They would grab my hand, look at me, and say, Pastor, I wish I could come to church just one more time. They are suffering. Their condition is deteriorating. And, and at one point, I know that both of them knew that they were battling with ailments that would take their lives, but all they wanted was to come to church just one time more time and, and, and that they didn't want to come to church to hear the pastor preach. They can hear better preaching on the radio. They, they, they didn't want to come to church to, to hear the choir. Our choir is great, but, but they can turn on the radio and hear some good singing. They, they didn't want to come to church to, to see y'all. You know, y'all good folks, but, but <laughs> you know, they, they, they didn't have to come to see you. They wanted to come to church because they wanted to be in the house of God to worship God, because even in the midst of their suffering, God was still worthy. Peter says to this suffering, persecuted, and abused congregation that regardless of what you're going through, you should still continue to revere God in your heart because God, regardless of what you're going through, is still worthy of our worship. Inwardly, we are to recognize that in spite of our suffering, we are still blessed. Upwardly, we are to continue to revere and worship God in spite of our suffering and outwardly. The second part of verse 14 is one of the favorite texts of evangelist and, and apologist. It, is a, it, it is a text that reminds us that whatever we are going through today, it is still not an excuse for us to actively and openly participate in the work of God. The text, that passage, makes two assumptions and has one expectation. Let me read it to you so you can feel the gist of it. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks of you to, to ask of you to give the reason for the hope that you have. The test rests, that, that, that sentence rests on two assumptions and one expectation. The first assumption that Peter makes is that the Christian, in the Christian life, you will have hope. That the Christian life will be a life of unending hope. In fact, one of the major themes of the book of 1 Peter is hope. In 1 Peter 1, chapter 3, Peter says that the Christian life is animated by hope, that God called us to experience a living hope. In 1 Peter 1, 13, we are exhorted to set our hope in the grace we have in Christ. And, and in 1 Peter 1, verse 21, we are reminded that our hope and faith Faith, it should be set on God. And Peter reminds this suffering congregation at every point to hold on to their hope because what people who are experiencing suffering need more than deliverance is hope. Hope in the midst of your suffering will help you endure to the next day. Hope will keep you going even when you don't see an end in sight. Hope is what this congregation needed 
in the middle of their persecution, in the middle of their abuse, in the middle of their suffering, because hope is what would help them see a light at the end of the tunnel. The Latin word for I breathe is sporango. And the Latin word for I hope is sporango. <laughs> because what breath is to the body, hope is to the soul. Without breath, we die. And without hope, we die. You, you, you know, this is not just true of people. This is also true of mice. In, in a freshman psychology textbook that you'll read in college, you'll, you'll, you'll find this interesting experiment done. A group of researchers, for whatever reason, took a, a, a mouse and put it into a beaker full of water. And the mouse continued to tread water for as long as he could tread water. And then he, he, he went down to the bottom. The researchers would then pick up the mouse as quickly as they can and, and I guess perform mouth-to-mouse -mouse resuscitation <laughs> and then put that mouse back into the beaker of water. And do you know at the second time, after they had given the mouse just a little hope that he would be rescued, the mouse would tread water for almost 10 times as long as he did the first time until out of sheer exhaustion he would fall down into the bottom of the water. Even for mouses, mice, it is important that they have hope. And Peter says that the assumption that he has of the Christian life is that even though we may not see an end to our suffering, that we will always experience hope. I know you've probably heard this one before, but, but it's probably one of my three or four favorite illustrations. Every time I preach on hope, I'm going to use this illustration, so expect to hear it again. An old mother in the church, after hearing a moving sermon, went up to her pastor and said, your, your sermon really hoped me today. Confused, the, the pastor looked at, at the old mother and said, you mean my sermon helped you today? And, and the old mother looked at him and said, no, no, no. Your sermon hoped me today. Confused, the, the pastor looked at the old mother and said, you, you mean my sermon helped you today? And, and again, the old mother corrected him and said, no, your sermon hoped me today. And the pastor asked the old mother, do you understand the difference between hope and helped? And the old mother said, yes, I do. But do you understand the difference between hope and helping? And obviously the pastor didn't, so he asked the old mother, can you please explain to me the difference between hope and help? And the old mother explained to him that hope is what you hold on to until your help comes. <laughs> Peter assumes that the Christian life will contain hope because our help may be way off into the future, but hope gives us something to hold on to until our help comes. Peter, first assumption that the Christian life will be a life of hope. And the second assumption that Peter makes is that outsiders will be attracted to the hope that we have. That even in the midst of being persecuted by others, there is something about the Christian life that will draw those who are persecuting Christians to that type of lifestyle. Even when they talk about you, lie on you, hate on you, there should be something about you that draws them to Jesus. Peter assumes that the people who are persecuting these Christians will be attracted to the lifestyle of hope that they lead. Billy Graham 
tells this wonderful and moving story of a Maasai warrior who found hope in Jesus. He, he was traveling along the road one day and he found a, a man who told him the message of the gospel, who preached the message of hope. And, and this Maasai warrior instantly believed in Christ and wanted more so than anything else to, to go to his village and tell his villagers, his friends and family members about the hope he had found in Christ. When, when he got to his village, the man's name was Joseph. He began knocking on doors and preaching this message of hope. He would tell people about the salvation offered in Christ, and, and he halfway expected the whole village, the, the faces of these people to be lit up and declare faith in, jo in Jesus Christ. But instead of being amazed and excited, the, their reaction was violent. They dragged Joseph, took him out of the city. The, the men of the village held Joseph down while the women of the city village beat him to nearly an inch of his life and, and they dragged him and threw him in a ditch. It's remarkable that, that Joseph survived. He got up, went to a near watering hold. He, he, he cleaned up his wounds, and, and he sat there and began to think. He, he knew that the gospel was a message of hope, and, and he knew that they needed to, to believe in the gospel. So he, he thought to himself, maybe I, I delivered the message wrong. So after three days, he went back to the village. He had rehearsed his gospel presentation and he started knocking on doors telling him, I have found hope in Jesus. And again, they took him outside the village. The, the men of the village held him down while the women beat him to nearly an inch of his life. It was remarkable that he survived the, the first beating. It was, it was miraculous that he survived the second beating. But, but Joseph, still filled with hope, went back to the watering hole, cleaned his wounds, and went back to the village thinking that the people need to hear the message of hope. True story. As he was returning to the village, he didn't have an opportunity to knock on doors. The villagers were there meeting him. The men of the village again picked him up, dragged him outside of the village, held him down, and they began to beat him. And while the women were beating him, before he passed out, before he became unconscious, he noticed that the women of the village were crying. He woke up to find that he was in his own bed. And the villagers had cleaned up his wounds. And now the villagers were receptive to hearing the message of the gospel because they saw the hope that Joseph had and Joseph tells this story to Billy Graham. He says now his entire village is Christian. There should be something about you, some hope in you, that even people who abuse you, even people who persecute you, even people who talk about you are attracted to you because of the hope you have. Peter assumes you will have hope. Peter assumes that people will be attracted to that hope. And Peter expects that when they come looking for that hope, you have a story to tell. The key phrase, the key word and that passage is the first word of that sentence, always. Let, let, let's do a quick word study. Always translates a Greek word that means always. Every time, every occasion, every moment. That means regardless of what you're going through, regardless of how bad your day has been, regardless of what argument you've had with your coworkers or your boss at work, regardless of how your husband or your wife is treating you at home, if someone wants to know about Jesus, you should be ready to tell them about Jesus. 
the always gives us no excuse to have a day off. The always means that there's never a circumstance where you shouldn't be prepared. The always is an indication that God expects you to be ready on every occasion and at every opportunity to tell somebody how good he's been to you and how Jesus has offered you salvation through the cross. Always be ready. And the challenge for us this morning, Central, is are we ready? Are you ready? Is that the goal and mission of your life? Or do you allow your circumstances to prevent you from sharing? Are, are you so unready, so consumed by what you're going through that you miss the opportunity that God gives you when you sit next to someone on the subway to tell them about Jesus? Are you so unready, so consumed by your circumstances that you don't even pay attention to the hurting co-workers that God has presented to you and you miss your opportunity to give them hope? Are you so unready, so consumed by yourself and your circumstances that you miss the opportunity that God gives you to share with your friends and family members always means we have no excuse. Regardless of what you're going through this morning, Central, regardless of what you've had to endure, you should always be ready. Will you pray with me? Father, thank you for the hope that we have. Thank you that is a, an eternal hope, a, a hope that will never die because it is a hope in you and in your son Jesus, Father God. And, and Father, we pray that this hope that we have will be able to attract others to find a similar hope in you and that we would be ready, Father. Now I pray, Lord God, as we give this part of the service to you. Ah, through prayers, through commitments, through dedication, Lord God, our hearts and our minds would be ready for what we encounter on the outside, Lord God. Help that uh, we would surrender to you whatever needs to be surrendered to you, whether it's our hearts or our circumstances. We give this time over to you. In Jesus' name.